ahead and uh, have a seat and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, probably what we're going to do is spend uh, this morning looking at the last uh, study, how to grow number five supernaturalized. Um, and that's week, the week 17 study. And then probably next week we'll do kind of a flyover of the whole study um, so that we can just remember kind of where we've come from and see it from the perspective of a big picture. So that's probably what we'll do while well, I'm working on getting the next uh, Sunday school study prepared. Um, I think that's what we'll do. So um, anyway, go ahead and turn if you have a booklet to, uh, to that week 17 page. It is almost the very last, well, it is the very last page with text on it. Uh, there is a blank uh, fold there at the very end, but, uh, but we're talking about transformation into uh, Christ's image as we, uh, uh, as we journey with him uh, by faith. So let's, uh, let's pray. Father, this morning, we thank you for bringing us here. We thank you for another day and for another um, day that can be set apart for the worship of the Lord uh, in a way that the other days that are still supposed to be uh, set apart for the worship of the Lord uh, simply, uh, simply are not uh, in the same sense as this day. And so we thank you, Lord, that, uh, that, that every week we begin reflecting upon Christ's lordship, his kingship, his resurrection, his authority. And I pray, O oh Lord, that as we open the scriptures today, that you would open our eyes and that the Spirit of God would help us uh, to know these things and to look more like Jesus and be closer to Jesus um, than when we, uh, when we first came. So we commit this to you in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so in the booklet there, um, you'll see that the central idea is the Holy Spirit will so transform us as we walk with him that when Christ returns, we will recognize him and he will recognize us. Think about those, uh, that text in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, many will say, Lord, Lord, and I will say, depart from me for I never knew you. That's him saying there will be many people uh, who I will not recognize uh, when they try to get in. Uh, but the promise of the New Testament is that for those who belong to Jesus, the Spirit is so working on them and conforming them to Christ's likeness that when we go to him, we will look like him. He will recognize us because he will see his reflection uh, when, he, uh, when he looks at us. And theologians uh, of old called this the beatific vision. And uh, just the idea is that we will see him and, uh, and he will see us. And so we're going to talk about that today. Go ahead and turn to that first main text, 2 Corinthians 3, uh, verses 17 and 18. A beautiful chapter here on, um, uh, on transformation. And um, let me read the first two verses. Well, let me read those two verses, verses 17 and 18. Then we'll talk about the verses that immediately precede uh, those. Um, so Paul says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Um, now, the context of this idea here, the context of these things that are being uh, spoken and taught, uh, is that the He's been using Moses and, the, and his experience on the mountain, going up, spending time with God, coming back down, and uh, telling the people the word and all of that as, a tie, as a, sort of a typological picture of our walk with God. So Moses, you remember, he goes up on the mountain, he, he spends time with God, he comes down, he's got a veil over his face. Why? Because, because he's been so with the Lord that God's glory has splashed onto him such that for people to see it, it would absolutely terrify them. Um, and so he puts a veil over his face. Um, but if anybody were to remove the veil, they would see the glory of God effectively as it were in the face of Moses. And Paul has been saying that this is sort of a picture of what it means to come to Christ. Look in verses 15 and 16 of that same chapter. Whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. So, so effectively what's happening is just like the veil covers, 
covers Moses' face coming down the mountain so they can't see the same glory that he saw. Um, when a person comes to Christ, they go from there being a veil so that they can't see his glory to trusting in him and seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, which is the next thing that he says in the next chapter. Uh, in chapter 4, verse 4, when he speaks of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And then in verse 6, um, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So when a person comes to Christ, the veil is removed and they come to the place where they see that all of divinity, all of Godhood is seen in the face of Jesus. He's the radiance of the glory of God, Hebrews says, the exact imprint of his nature. What did he tell his disciples in John 14? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you want to know who the Father is, look at me. I perfectly radiate his glory uh, and his presence to you. And so, and so when we come to Christ, as verses 17 and 18 say there, um, there's freedom. There's freedom there in uh, verse 17. Jesus spoke about this freedom. Um, Galatians unpacks this freedom. Um, the idea being that whereas we're enslaved to sinful desires and fleshly ideas and things like that, we're set free from those things when we come to Christ to be the people who we are made to be uh, in fellowship uh, with God. There's freedom, and the freedom is to the end of transformation. Verse 18, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory uh, to another. So we are transformed um, into this image that we behold whereas Christ is the face of God, as it were. Um, again, as Hebrews says, he's the radiance of the glory of God. Um, the, the Greek word there, if I remember correctly, is the word icon. He's the icon of the glory of God. As we behold God's glory in his face, the Spirit of God is causing us to actually be transformed into that image. We're being divinized, as it were. That's probably not the right way to, right way to pronounce it, but in one sense, we are, uh, we are becoming God-like, uh, not in the sense that we become divine ourselves, like the same way that God is, uh, but in the same, same sense that Moses, he could be transformed going up on the mountain, spending time with God. Now that we are in fellowship with God through his Son, that glory that splashed onto Moses splashes onto us, such that we are we are looking like him as the days go by. This might be hard to see if you look at yourself because most of the time when we think about ourselves and our, our own growth and all of that, um, the enemy's voice is pretty strong in our ears. You've not really grown like you think that you have. Um, you've not made any progress. This is all a sham. This is all a lie. Um, and that's why we have to, as Lloyd-Jones said, we have to talk to ourselves more than we're listening to ourselves. We've got to preach the truth to ourselves. The truth is that I am being transformed into the image of Christ. I am um, taking the glory that belongs to him into myself and onto myself. Um, I'm enjoying fellowship with God the Father the same way that Christ does. I mean, this, is, this is why Jesus could spend his whole night in prayer uh, from time to time. He would spend all this time in prayer to his Father because he just loved spending time with his Father and in the same way, you do as well. You enjoy God. You find him to be a delight. Um, he's not a burden to you, but he is, uh, he, he's, your, he's your only friend who you worship. Hopefully you have a lot of friends, but you don't have any other friends like him who's worthy of worship. But indeed, as you worship him, you enjoy fellowship with him. You love being a friend of God and being able to call him your friend as well. That is because Christ is in you. Uh, through his spirit. So spirit works on us over time and through trial and all the means of grace uh, for, two tr uh, for true, I should say, transformation. That word for transformed, I believe it's metamorpheo in Greek. And um, where we get the word metamorphosis from, it's, it's a substantial change that is occurring in us. Not, not from something that we are not to something that we become any more than, say, some kind of plant or something like that undergoes a metamorphosis where it, it, it changes 
substantially, but, but again, not in a way that it becomes something it's not, but that it becomes something that it's supposed to be. You and I, in a similar way, we become the people that God made us to be. We're brought into fellowship with him. And, um, and this happens through the Lord who is the Spirit. So thoughts on this before we look at 1 John 3. Um, just thinking again about how the goal of salvation is transformation. And the goal of transformation is coming into God's presence fully one day. That's the journey that we're on right now. Any thoughts on these matters, Mr. Ward? Reflecting, interesting. Well, I guess probably a, a theologically sound answer, I think, uh, would be that it's not necessarily one or the other, right? Um, we, it's both. As we behold him, to behold him is to reflect him because he's so just, so bright, so glorious. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to look in the Greek to, to make, my, make my decision over, uh, over what I believe and therefore what you should believe. I'm just kidding. Um, but I'd have to look at it, yeah. I want, I'm actually wondering if I have that too. Um, I do, I do. Beholding the glory. You got ESV? Well, the Greek is the Father's ESV. All right. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Uh, yeah, beholding the glory of the Lord or reflecting the glory of the Lord. Yeah, yeah. To behold is to reflect. That's uh, that's true. So let's. Amen. Praise God. Um, you know, it's an interesting thing because as evangelical Christians, we are, um, we're Bible people, you know, uh, as not only evangelical Christians, but Baptist ones. Uh, we are, we really try to be Bible people. We really want to always have the scriptures open. And sometimes uh, what it can sound like, and, and if we're not careful, maybe this can be the case, we can be so centered on the Bible that we forget the purpose of the Bible. The purpose of the Bible is to be the means through which God communicates with us and the means through which we know him. Um, I don't think that there will be any Bibles in heaven. There won't be, because there won't be a need for it, because we will just be with the Lord fully, and uh, we won't need his communication through this means anymore, but for now how thankful we should be that we have his word in written form given to us, protected from all the translation um, corruptions and inaccuracies over the centuries. You know, that used to bother me a lot in my early 20s until eventually I got to the place where I said, you know, if, God's, if God is God, he has the ability to protect his word and give it to me 2,000 years after it was finished. I can trust what I'm reading here. Um, because, because it is used for a purpose, and that is fellowship, uh, enjoyment of, uh, of the Lord, hearing from him, and uh, even more. Go ahead, Bob. I just looked at the uh, New King James. I tried to take it. It doesn't say, I'll say, I'll say, you hold it as in a mirror. As in a mirror. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. As in a mirror. Yep, go ahead, Peter. As in a mirror? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And also in the uh, 1901 American Standard versions are the same. I'm going to look, uh, 
See, this is another reason why I should have my Greek New Testament with me while we're doing Sunday school. This has happened multiple times where I've been like, oh, I wish I had that with me. Um, and yet I still, <clears throat> still am not, not learning my lesson here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry about that. Especially sorry to those who were, uh, who were listening online. Um, what verse are we looking at here? Verse 18, 18. Have been uncovered. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. So, um, so what you have is you have uncovered face, so unveiled face, the glory of the Lord mirroring um, from one degree of glory to another. So I think that the reason why those translations use um, the phrase there. Uh, as in a mirror, is because the actual translation, or the the word uh, kataptrizomenoi, that's a lot of syllables, actually means mirroring, so that's why they do that. But um, ESV, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord. Yeah, I don't know. I could see it going either way, actually. But that is funny, as in a mirror, isn't it? It's like, um, you think about looking at yourself in the mirror and, uh, you know, depending on how early it is in the morning, how, how much of a horror that can be. Um, and, uh, but you're, you know, but there's no hindrances. You see, you're looking right at yourself. And in one sense, this is, this is what this fellowship is that the Lord's describing uh, for us here, that we are face-to-face. Uh, with the Lord, with unveiled face, as it were. Peter. Yeah, we also have the uh, original Hebrew that says that, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Mm-hmm. So, as in a glass, yeah. 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 That's Yeah, that's right. And, and if we're as the years go by, if we look and we keep looking, I think the hope is that we see Christ more uh, in ourself. Of course, again, because we're going to constantly be hearing the enemy's accusations, um, sometimes it's hard to hear, or it's hard to see uh, Christ. But, but if we really take inventory of where we were uh, and where we've come and the trajectory of where we're going, we can see. We can see Christ in us. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, is, is it accurate to say that the word glory there is pertaining to the Son of God, right? So mm-hmm. I find it interesting that it spends, to your point, a little bit of a stumbling block because of the way we typically view ourselves. That's right. I think the text is saying that presently, yeah. no matter where you are, There is an element of glory to the believer. And glory is the outshining of the character of God. So, That's right. You know, we're, we're going from one stage of glory to ultimately another, you know, that is perfected. But uh, it's a pretty amazing thought. That yeah. Even as we sit here, you know, struggling with our sins and uh, all the rest, um, God makes a pronouncement. Yeah. That there is a glory. Um, that shines from every That's right. That's exactly right. Um, I think you're right. Uh, I would say this. As we come into fellowship with, uh, with the triune God, the glory is indeed, as you said, a glory that comes from Him, but it does begin to apply to us. So... So he brings us from the created realm where there has been a wall with cherubim guarding the doorpost. He brings us spiritually into fellowship with him such that we are with Christ and that that glory of God is, is then coming out to us such that it's his glory, but we then receive it as a, as a gift. In the same way that we receive justification 
uh, imputed righteousness, we are also receiving imputed um, glorification as the days go by. Do you have another thought? Yeah, it's just sort of like, you know, the birds of light, the light yeah. so shine yeah. before men that they may see your good work and then glorify your Father in heaven. So the light that emerges from your eyes is ultimately God's glory. Yeah. And this reflects back. That's exactly right, yeah. Um, you know, so Jesus says, let your light shine before others. He also says, I'm the light of the world. He says, you are the light of the world. Matthew 5, I am the light of the world, John 8. Well, which one is it, Jesus? It's both. It's both. As we are in fellowship with him, his light is in us such that, um, such that it's, it's really ours, but it's also his. Carolyn. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, the, it's that tension, isn't it, between the flesh and the spirit? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. That's a good way to put it. Uh, there's both the flesh and the spirit in us. That's to keep us humble and to keep us accessible to people so we can shine our light to them. Um, and we long for the day when that will no longer be needed. When we can just enjoy the Lord, I think to your uh, to your point, um, Jeff, earlier, a couple scriptures that pertain to this exact idea that it's our glory would be Second Thessalonians one twelve. There's, that's one. Second Thessalonians one twelve, and then another one is First Peter one, I believe eight and nine. Let me um, let me just read these. To this end, Paul says, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. That's verse 11. So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so that his name would be glorified in you and you glorified in him. According to what? According to grace. He's brought you to himself, his glory in you. You then are glorified in him, and then he gets the glory in, in the end. He's the one who gets the praise because this is his activity. Um, so it's a pretty remarkable phrase, you glorified in him. Same idea is, uh, is stated in 1 Peter 1. Oh, I said verse 8. I, I should have said verse 7. Bear with me here. Um, it's actually 1 Peter 1, 7, where Peter says, speaking about the trials, the necessary trials that we uh, endure, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, now, you know, it, it would certainly seem like Peter's point is that this is a praise, glory, and honor that we receive at the end. It's the same as our Lord, or as the master telling the good steward of the five talents and the two talents, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the glorification. Um, same kind of thing going on here. Um, as we endure the trial, as we go through all kinds of testings, it will in the end result in praise, glory, and honor. Uh, when our Lord returns. So, so this idea of, of glorification, um, us receiving glory that is actually God's, um, but we are so in him and so close to him and so in fellowship with him and like him um, in many ways, like him that we can receive glory with him too. Um, it's just, it, it, I gotta be honest with you, such thoughts are too high, I cannot attain to them. Like David says in the psalm, I can't, 
I, I just, maybe in 15, 20 years, maybe I'll be able to talk about it a little bit better, uh, but I'm just not there right now. It's hard for me to kind of get my mind uh, around it. Um, but I'm being transformed, so maybe, maybe later on. <clears throat> Let's turn to 1 John 3. 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. And thus we see here the same message preached by different apostles. Because indeed, they have the same Lord who is empowering the same gospel witness through them. 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, John says, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears... We shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. So I love what it says. <clears throat> Even though we, oh, let me read verse 3 as well. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So um, while we're talking about what will happen, John starts in verse 2 by reminding us of what has happened. We are God's children now. That's good to know. I might not be all the way to the place of, of um, Christ-likeness that I, sh- you know, that I will be one day, and I might still have a ways to go. Um, I might be, as it were, uh, only halfway up the ladder uh, now. Um, but we are God's children now. The very fact that you're on the ladder, the very fact that you're on the staircase proves that he has drawn you and pulled you into fellowship with his son. So... We are God's children now, he says, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But when he appears, we'll be like him because we shall see him as he is. Just that that last little thing there, he says in verse 3, is not an add-on, but everyone who thus hopes in him, that is to say, everybody who is longing for this future glorified state of Christ-likeness, godliness, and the glory that comes with that. Everybody who hopes in Christ to get us there, because it says everyone who thus hopes in him, hopes in him to get us there, purifies himself as he is pure. That is to say, we're going to take growth and grace seriously. We're not going to be lazy in our, uh, in our discipleship. We really, we really want this because we trust in him. We want to get closer to him and and be more firmly rooted uh, in him. And uh, so, you know, Paul says in Romans 6, shall we, shall we sin so that, uh, so that grace will abound now that we've been saved? Can we just live however our flesh desires for us to live? Uh, no, the whole purpose of this is to destroy the works of the flesh within us and to be led by the Spirit. Um, and so that's, that's the same thing that John is saying. So uh, I just would remind you quickly that... Um, Psalm 15 and Psalm 24, both psalms, uh, basically, if I'm paraphrasing, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and an upright heart. That is to say, you've got to be prepared to come into God's presence. Uh, it's picking up the, uh, the language of the, the high priest who had to go through this, this incredible cleansing process before he could go um, into the holy place. Um, because the idea is that God is holy, we are not. You have to be prepared in order to come into his presence. The psalmist then says, who can come, uh, seems to be sort of pointing to the future day when everybody um, is invited and not just the high priest. Who can come, the one who's been prepared, the one who's been clean. That's why the, the ascent of Jesus to, uh, to the Father's right hand is so significant, because the idea is that there is somebody who truly has clean hands and an upright heart, uh, who has been invited fully into God's uh, heavenly temple. But he says that he's going to come and take us to himself. So it must be the case that the whole goal here is that we would have clean hands and an upright heart to be able to come into God's presence. Positionally, we already have it. Positionally, we are clean in Christ. We're clothed in his robe of righteousness. But he's working out this practically so that, uh, so that, so that we will not only appeal to our positional 
uh, righteousness, but so that we will be, we will have grown in righteousness and truly have clean hands and an upright heart. I guess what I'm trying to say is that, um, let's see, did I already use this side? No, I didn't. Um, The door into fellowship with God in heaven is a door, there's a doorknob that has a halo over it. And um, the only way that a person can get to God is if they travel through this door of holiness. So what does Jesus do? Christ puts himself in the doorway becomes indeed the door himself so that people like us, I'm trying to think of a way that I can make us look um, sort of, I, I don't know, more like, uh, more like lazy, sinful people, but when you're drawing stick figures, you're pretty limited in what you can draw. I don't want to make us like overweight or something like that. That's just, it wouldn't be a stick figure anymore. Um, but, uh, but the only way that we can get there is if we come through this door of holiness. So Jesus is the door so that he can then take us into the presence of God. Um, whoops, excuse me. Psalm 15, Psalm 24. So that God's holiness is always the standard that never changes. And we're being prepared for that. We're being made ready. Uh, for them. Only the clean can come, and um, the fact that we have the Spirit of God proves that Jesus has cleansed us and brought the Spirit into our lives. And what does the New Testament say? That the Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. The Spirit within us is the guarantee uh, that we will, we will make it. We will go there one day. Um, thoughts on these things? I know we've, uh, we've gone pretty deep here on um, this idea of being supernaturalized, but any thoughts on these things? Jeff? Um, the, uh, the distinction that, that you make there, I think, between positionally and then what I would call relationally is really important. Um, relationally, that's interesting. Yeah, because uh, positionally, So that's our positional place, but then relationally, I kind of think maybe the song, Who Shall Ascend the Hill of the Lord, right? So I think we know that to the extent that we're walking with God and really living uh, for Him, that we will experience that wonderful blessing of being in the presence of God. Yeah. We're there positionally, but relationally, yeah. it's, it's a little bit of a different story mm -hmm. that we have to work on. That verse in First Peter, um, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, if necessary. The thought is that if you became a Christian, you came to faith, and if you were to die that day, um, no opportunity for sanctification. It's fine. Christ has already cleansed the person. Um, but if you didn't, if you ended up having 50 or 60 more years on earth before glory after you came to Christ... Um, it must be God's will that you go through this kind of, this relational cleansing, growth and grace, sanctification, all of that. And um, that must be why the Lord has chosen to keep you on earth for this time, is to prepare you. Uh, so, absolutely. I don't know. I guess that's from Psalm 24. Yeah. 
That's the, that's the catch right there. Yeah. Um, that's why he'd go and the glory would be on his face, but over time it would go away. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so as we behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, it's a glory that's not going away. Um, because the work is complete in Christ, even if the work in us is not complete yet. Um, let's, let's move on here because I'm running out of time, but, the, but go to the second supporting idea. Second supporting idea. Uh, so we spent 40 minutes on the first supporting idea. Uh, the second supporting idea, the Holy Spirit's work is transformation, which is part of the advantage of him being with us instead of Jesus' physical presence. Um, you know, this is what he said in John 15. Um, again, another, another misquote. It's not John 15, 7 and 8. It's, um, let me find it here. Bear with me here. It's in John 15, I'm pretty sure. Um, maybe it's in John 14, actually. Yeah, sorry about this. Well, wherever it is, uh, most of us have some degree of familiarity with it. Yeah, yeah, okay, John 16, 7, and 8. Not 15, 16, 7, and 8. Jesus tells the disciples, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Now we, you know, we tend to think of the day that we find ourselves in as the day that um, could not possibly be called an advantage over the time when Jesus was on earth walking with the disciples physically. Um, But maybe that's because we've misunderstood Christ's redemptive work. It's actually not better for you to be walking physically with Jesus on the earth than it is for you to have access to the Holy Spirit right now to your advantage that I go away. Why? Because when Jesus is with the disciples, um, they are not beholding his glorified state in a transformative way. Look all through their lives. They're just, they're messing up all over the place. Peter's denying knowing him. He's getting in front of him and Jesus is calling him Satan, all of that. But the Holy Spirit comes and he makes such a substantial difference in their lives such that Peter can go from the, um, you know, stuttering buffoon, basically, uh, with foot and mouth syndrome to the great, powerful Pentecost preacher. As that for alliteration, powerful Pentecost preacher. Uh, Peter, the powerful Pentecost preacher. Um, It was the Holy Spirit who made the difference. The Holy Spirit's poured out. Jesus says, it is to your advantage that I go away. And part of that advantage is, is exactly this, that he takes... Christ's image and begins applying it to us internally. Before, it wasn't happening this way. Now it happens this way. It's happening internally for us. That's why Jesus said earlier in John 14, 17, the spirit of truth, he spoke of him and said, the spirit whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. The spirit who has been with you, Jesus says, in my presence, uh, we know... That's what Luke uh, tells us about Isaiah, about quoting Isaiah, that, uh, that the Spirit of the Lord was upon the Messiah as he came into the world. Uh, and in his preaching, uh, my words are spirit and life. The Spirit's been with you, but he will be in you. That's far, far greater than the Spirit simply being with you. And again, maybe I can't do justice to explaining uh, this phenomenon. I just think that we, uh, we've misunderstood something if we think, boy, it would be better if I could be with the disciples walking with Jesus on earth 2,000 years ago. Jesus says, it is an advantage to you that I leave and send the Spirit to you. It's better because then he can take everything that's good about me and he can begin to plant it in you in a way that, in a way that it wasn't possible uh, before. So it's to your advantage, Jesus says. Um, 
Next supporting idea, when Jesus returns, we'll not only see him, we've already talked about this, but we'll see him as he is, 1 John 3, 2. That can only mean that in some sense we will have been made ready to see the God who no one can see. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 16, no one can see God, no one has seen God. But he tells us that we're going to. Um, I would say that anybody who's ever beheld the glory of the Lord throughout redemptive history has done so um, it's been through a mediated um, knowledge of the glory of God. Jacob wrestled with the God-man that one night. Isaiah in Isaiah 6 saw his glory, uh, it says, and spoke of him. And uh, that's what John says about Isaiah in John 12. He says that he saw Christ's glory and spoke of him. It's been a mediated um, knowledge of God's glory. There's coming a day when, whereas in one sense, it will always be immediated knowledge of God's glory, such that we are always going to worship God and the Lamb. We're always going to remember the redeeming work of the Lamb. Nevertheless, we are going to behold Him. We will see Him as He is. And that's just a remarkable thing, because as He is now, he's, His eyes are blazing with fire. You know, he's, he's this hero through the book of Revelation. He seems glorious. It's using imagery that is a gracious condescension to us, we will see him as he is, um, John tells us. And uh, I just, I can't, honestly, like I can't imagine. I really can't imagine what it's going to be like. Um, but I believe it. And, uh, and it sounds wonderful to me. Um, so last thing we'll just say here is that every trial is growing and perfecting, as James 1 says, uh, and it will have its effect for our good. Let, um, let, what's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to misquote it here if I don't, uh, if I don't read it. James 1, 3 and 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let, that's it, let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I was talking with a man yesterday in the preaching class about, uh, about the first verse of the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Most of the time in preaching school, they tell you that you've got to start off with some kind of really engaging uh, introduction, something that's going to like really grab people's attention and maybe get them excited or something. And how, What's Jesus' introduction to his sermon? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you're not at home in this world internally or externally, if you're not happy with yourself and if you're not happy with the world, you can receive the kingdom. That's his introduction. And I was just thinking about it last night after we talked about it yesterday morning. Um, what better way for Jesus to um, sow poverty of spirit in a way that doesn't crush people but leads them to that attitude that's necessary but by what he does the rest of the chapter in Matthew 5 by showing God's true standard of holiness and righteousness, which by the end of it, the last verse in Matthew 5, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Lord, who's sufficient for these things? Who can do these things? Ah, now you're starting to have some poverty of spirit where you just understand your absolute need for Christ every step of the way. Um, and so... In one sense, this is exactly what is required for us to, um, to grow in Christ's likeness is to need Christ. And uh, so he gives us his standard all the time so that indeed we will. This is all by faith. We can't see these things with our, with our eyes, but we have to trust the Lord. Walk by faith, not by sight. Believe in God, Jesus says. Believe also in me. He's just distinguishing between the Father and the Spirit there. We trust in him, we cling to him, and we say, even if I don't understand, I don't have to. Um, and he is going to finish the work that he's begun. Any other thoughts uh, to, uh, to close us out here today? Any other thoughts from anybody else? As you and I are being supernaturalized as the days go by. That's not to say that the outer self isn't wasting away. Of course it is, Right? but we are being supernaturalized. Go ahead, Mary.
take a hammer to us. Yeah. yeah. And say, okay, hey, listen to me. Yeah. And you do. Um, and, you know, you made this um, music very simple to be good. Mm -hmm. I can understand it. But we're all about a journey. Yeah. And like you said, the longer you go, the more you realize everything is not in your, it's not with, you're not going to change it. Mm. You're going down the road that God wants you to. Yeah. And I can see why God would want to come back. This time the world, mm. I wouldn't want to come back either. I'd be afraid. That's interesting. Yeah. Because I'll be down there watching the spirit of me than have somebody who speaks my name. Mm hmm. Well, they they won't, they won't. He's glor he's uh, he's glorious. He's gonna he's gonna come back to win, right? <laughs> he's already won. Yeah. But I, I think your point, Mary, is it's it's really well taken. There's um, when you're talking about going down the path, all I can think about is when I have to get someplace in the car and I put it on the GPS. I am totally at the mercy of the GPS. If I if I'm using the GPS because I don't know where I'm going. And I'm totally at its mercy, and I don't know exactly where it's going to take me to get there. But I trust. I trust that it knows more than I do. Maybe this can kind of be an illustration of walking with the Lord. Um, I don't know how he's going to get me to glory, but I know that he's going to. And, yeah. It's a good attitude. Yeah. That's faith. That's faith. Well said. Well said. Thanks. All right, let me pray. Let me pray and then we'll be done. So, Father, today, uh, indeed, we trust that you are leading us on the journey. We trust that you not only know all that can be known, but that you are good and work good for us. We thank you, Lord, for that. And our prayer, Lord, is that as we've, as we've studied these uh, concepts from the Scripture about growth and grace, I pray, O oh Lord, that it's, uh, the sum of it uh, would, would equal, indeed, growth and grace. Uh, may we trust the Lord more. Uh, may we hate sin more. And may we enjoy uh, the presence of God more than before. I pray, O oh Lord, that we would understand our lives and indeed all of history as belonging to you. And um, indeed, as we just uh, said here at the end, um, if the Lord were to, were to come back in his, uh, in his first state when he first came, uh, yeah, the world would crucify him again uh, if, if that were his will as it was indeed as he submitted himself to the cross to be crucified. But when you return, uh, you will return with glory. And every eye indeed will see, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May we, O oh Lord, be ready for that by confessing your Lordship today. And we pray that you would be with us uh, today as we worship you. Let the Spirit be in our midst as we uh, go into a morning worship today. Be with our fellowship, be with the prayers, be with the singing, be with the message. We commit this all to you in Christ's righteous and matchless name. Amen. Amen.